Welcome to Zechariah 12 through 14. This is our 24th week in the 52-week study through the Bible. You can see right here, week 24, and there's our text, Zechariah 12 to 14. Now, if you look at that slide, it's kind of, you know, in your face. It's one of those uh, dramatic pictures, but it hardly captures what we're looking at. We're looking at the most prophesied event in the Bible, and we're looking at the most utterly futile, um, almost mindless behavior of humanity. What we're going to see today is when all humanity assembles to fight against God. Before we get there, it's in the book of Zechariah, and you probably have gotten there in your Bible, but Zechariah was a, a very interesting character in the Bible. In fact, his grave is one of my favorite places to visit when we go to the Holy Land. The grave of Zechariah is right on the side of the Mount of Olives, looking directly into what we would call the Temple Mount. You look right over the Eastern Gate, you see the Dome of the Rock, you see all the, the parts of modern day Jerusalem. But if you strip all that away, the reason I love the tomb of Zechariah was that when he wrote these words, especially if you look at uh, verse 3 of chapter 12, it says, though all the nations of earth are gathered against Jerusalem. When Zechariah wrote those words, he was looking at Jerusalem destroyed by the Babylonians. He was looking at rocks that had burn marks and scorch marks and black soot on them. He was looking at like a ghost town, like desolation, like, like you would look at, at uh, what New York looked like after 9-1-1, the, the terrorist attack. It just looked like a disaster. And God said, I'm going to make all the nations of the earth gather here. It took a lot of faith for Zechariah to write those words down and say, I am, I am the prophet of God, and I'm telling you, thus saith the Lord, all the nations of the earth are coming here, and they're going to fight against God. That's why I like to go there. And each year when we take groups to the Holy Land, we sit there, and I have them sit looking out at the city of Jerusalem, uh, outside of his grave on benches, looking from the Mount of Olives toward the city of Jerusalem, and I read these verses we're going to look at. So you can kind of just look past me teaching and think in the background, the city of Jerusalem is spread out before you. So World War III, what we know as Armageddon, when the whole world goes to war against God. Now this is what God told us was going to happen. Do you remember way back in Psalm 2? Uh, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands in pieces and cast away their cords from us. We don't want our creator anymore. We don't want our judge. We don't want our redeemer. Get away from us. That's the foolishness that God sees in the hearts of his created, in his likeness, human beings. Wow. Look what verse 4 says. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh, Psalm 2, 4. The Lord will hold them in derision, and then he'll speak to them in his wrath. He really does. When he speaks to them in his wrath, they melt. They melt. They're, they're incinerated by the wrath of God. Look at Revelation 19. That's actually the moment this happens. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Who's sitting on the horse? The Lord Jesus Christ. Where is he coming? He's coming in the sky. He's headed toward Armageddon, the, the valley of Megiddo, and he is up there in the sky and all the nations of the earth are with all their armaments ready to fight him. And you know what it says? He speaks and they're instantly killed. Let's, let's go through this amazing study. 
Jesus says Jerusalem, as we're going to see in Zechariah 12 to 14, is God's clock that's counting down to this moment, the, the return of Christ, the most prophesied event in the Bible. And the close of world history is tied to that little city. We saw that when we were in Ezekiel 37 to 39 last week. And all the world will slowly get fixated on Jerusalem. That's God's plan. And then history will culminate right there in Jerusalem when Jesus descends to the Mount of Olives. What's that going to be like? Well, it's going to be the fulfillment of a lot of prophecy because look at this. Jerusalem is mentioned over a thousand times in God's word. Jerusalem is the most mentioned place in the Bible. You find more times God talks about Jerusalem, 814 times in 766 verses, plus he calls it Zion 160 times, plus he calls it the city of David 46 times. Jerusalem is vital to God's plan. Here, God promised that Jesus would be the Lamb of God when he promised a Redeemer to Abraham. Here, David was promised a future son that would have an endless kingdom. The second coming of Christ establishes that kingdom. And it's here, most important to every one of us, God has worked his plan of redemption. Jerusalem is huge in the Bible. Here's just a, a quick kind of um, uh, tour I'll give you of the city of Jerusalem. This is what we call the old city today. Uh, this is what it looks like. You've probably seen the, the Temple Mount, the, the Dome of the Rock right there. You know the four quarters of Jerusalem. Uh, basically, we have the Muslim quarter, uh, the Christian quarter, the Jewish quarter, and the Armenian quarter. But this is what I want you to see. This is the old city. This is, if you go to Jerusalem today, that little area, the old city, is a little less than a square mile. And it's packed full of little alleys and souks and all kinds of incredible places that I personally could just wander around the old city of Jerusalem endlessly with my Bible. And uh, between drinking, you know, a cup of coffee and reading the Bible, I would just be happy as a clam, just enjoying, immersing myself in all those centuries of biblical history. But look, look at this. Most people don't realize that right outside the walls of the old city Jerusalem, headed down the hill between the Kidron Valley and the Hinnom Valley, is the city of David right there. See, the city of David is like a tongue that's sticking out uh, of the city of David. It just is a, it's just a kind of a, a ramp that comes down. L let me show you a different view of it. Uh, this is the... Dome of the Rock that everybody can pick out of a picture anyway, anywhere. Uh, it's on the biblical site called Mount Moriah. Beside it, right here, is what's called the Kidron Valley. This is ground zero. This is the Mount of Olives where Jesus is going to return. Uh, Kidron Valley right down here is where Gethsemane is, uh, where Jesus would go back and forth with his disciples. He'd walk down this hill and back up this hill. Uh, this right here is the city of David, the city of David that I just showed you. And here is the Hinnom Valley. And by the way, just for you to know, the book of Joel tells us, for all of you that love prophecy, uh, this is where Jesus will return right here on the Mount of Olives. This is the Hinnom Valley and where the Hinnom Valley meets the Kidron Valley. So see, the Kidron Valley comes right around and right here they meet, right here, is called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And you know what Joel said? That's where the judgment of all the survivors of the tribulation is going to take place. The angels are going to bring them. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 13 and, and also in Matthew 26. And he brings all them here. And they, in, in chapter 25 of Matthew, in verse 41, he's going to say, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared, prepared for the devil and his angels. That is right here. This is the great judgment called the sheep and goat judgment, where the angels bring everybody that's alive on earth and sets them down, and the Lord separates them between the sheep, those that believed in him and followed him, and the goats, those that rejected him, 
and the the lost people, the goats, the rebels, are going to be uh, immediately wait for the final judgment. But all that is right here in front of the city of David. And look what's at the bottom. When Abraham was coming north from Hebron, down where he lived, bringing with him Isaac, he comes up this valley and comes right up on his way to Mount Moriah to offer Isaac and goes by the city of David, then called Salem, where Melchizedek was. See, so many events are right here clustered, and that's why it's such an important place to study. Well, here's my journal, because I want to jump into this. There, there are three chapters, and because there are three chapters we have to study, we're, we're going to have to uh, look at them in many different ways, because there's so many biblical truths and so many doctrines. Uh, one of the things uh, that's hard for me is we're done with the Old Testament. <laughs> but we're starting the New Testament next week. We start the New Testament when I give you the kickoff class. Now remember, for those of you that are just maybe trying to figure out what this video is, we are looking at a one year long study of the Bible. We call it the 52 Greatest Chapters. Uh, online, if you go to our Facebook page, you can find the entire study with the details, uh, what you need, how to do the study, the devotional method, and the chapters we're studying. And we're on the 24th week this week and it's Zechariah 12 to 14, but next time I'm going to introduce for you, look at this, when we start the New Testament, Matthew 1 and 2. And we're going to just be hitting the greatest chapters of the New Testament. Just the, the first six weeks are Christ's birth and, you know, and King Herod and the Magi. Then we're going to go into Jesus' longest sermon, we know as the Sermon on the Mount. Then we're going to go into the Great Commission, and the whole resurrection in chapter, see the 28th chapter is the resurrection of Christ, his uh, showing himself to his disciples, and then him taking them up on the mountaintop. And we're gonna actually go there. And I'm gonna show you, I, I believe personally, the mountain, it has a, a article before, it's not a mountain, it's the mountain. In Galilee, most likely is the most prominent one that you see, everybody that visits there. It's called Arbel and it just towers over the Sea of Galilee. We're gonna go there and study that 28th chapter. Then the Good Samaritan you've always heard of, the prodigal son you've always heard of, and John chapter one. What a fascinating study. Jesus reveals himself with seven titles, with the beginning of all these sevens in the, in the book of John, and tells us that he is the eternal word, the creator, as well as the Messiah, the promised one, who is Jesus, our Savior. So just a little peek at where we're going, but we're in week 24, and uh, we're in Zechariah 12 to 14, and from my notes that I've worked on with, just like you're going to all week long, I have been studying this like I'm sitting across the table from you. I really see that in my mind. Uh, this morning when I got up early and, and was sitting out there finishing up Zechariah, knowing that I was going to meet with you today, I thought about maybe in heaven, all the alumni of the 52 greatest chapters, maybe we can get together. We'll have to message each other uh, because I'm hearing from more and more of you. And thank you. Thank you for your encouraging messages. Uh, Bonnie and I are full-time missionaries. Uh, we travel on the road. We're staying right now in missionary housing, driving a missionary car, working in a missionary studio, teaching virtual classes to the next generation, to young people all over the world. We hear from them. We hear from them. And uh, when we start the New Testament next week, and, and maybe by the uh, time we get to the Great Commission chapter, I'm going to actually show you all the other members of, of our studies that, that are joining us. And they're actually from 30 different countries around the world. We never thought that after three decades in pastoral ministry, we would be talking to you, and you would be our small group scattered across the world, but we're training classes of young people preparing to serve the Lord. And I hope that's what you want to do. Well, the title in our journal, we always write, you know, the, the week we're on, the chapter we're studying, then our title, and you're going to see I have many different titles. Uh, they'll come out throughout this uh, study. One is the final siege of Jerusalem and Christ's return. 
A summary is that God explains, look at this, that he who created all things controls and holds the future for Israel. So the God who created the universe says, I'm watching out for Israel and they'll never cease to be a nation. So a lot of people say, aren't you afraid to go to Israel? I go, no, safest place in the world. I know it's at the end of the world, still standing. <laughs> I know the Mount of Olives is gonna be there. I know that the Temple Mount's gonna be there. If you wanna go someplace that for sure is not gonna get destroyed by climate change or nuclear holocaust, go to Jerusalem, okay? Because it's there at the end and so are God's people. Uh, basically, here are the lessons I found. And look in your Bible, Zechariah verses one and two. And I found that God stretched out the heavens, Greek word in the Septuagint, the translation of the Hebrew Old Testament is cosmos, lays the foundations of earth, the geos, and he's the one who forms the spirit of breath in man. That's the Greek word pneumos. Wow, what an introduction. That's who we're studying about. That's who's returning. That's our God. And we worship him, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In verses two to six, God made Jerusalem, look at this, the center of world history. And I'm actually gonna show you these markings. I took pictures so, so you could actually see how important all this wording is. And I'll, I'll show it to you, but this is just my summary. God made Jerusalem the center of world history. Then God introduces his son to us. And by the way, when we get to chapter 13, the people of Israel are still in Jerusalem at the end when God does a cleansing of the land. In other words, no amount of Iranian uh, warnings and Palestinian uprisings and United Nations decrees are gonna change the fact that Jerusalem is forever the place that God has placed his name and said, this is my city, these are my people, and I'm going to make them a very heavy stone, verse three of chapter 12, for the whole world. Israel was in the news today, again. There was a, uh, one of their military plants where they developed things was testing something and kind of like Elon Musk, SpaceX, you know, rockets, one of them blew up. And Iran went ecstatic. They said Israel had a failure. And Israel said, hey, we're, we're testing some of the most advanced weapons in the world and if one blows up, we're learning from it. But you know, why would we even hear about that? Because the eyes of the world because Jerusalem and the people of God and the nation of Israel are a very heavy burden for the world. Then, sadly, Zechariah 13, seven nine tells us two thirds of all the Jews alive on earth. Now, right now, there are about 10 or 15 million. Two thirds of them, if this happened today, two thirds would die in this final Holocaust where the Antichrist, Satan, and all the forces of the world are closing in on Jerusalem, and they're coming closer and closer and closer, and they're starting to slaughter and, and just decimate the population of the Jewish people in Jerusalem. And when they get down to only one third left, they're hitting what God calls, and what the book of Romans chapter 9, 10, 11 calls the remnant. Those are the believing ones. Among them will be the 144,000 that we've already heard about um, many times, and we're going to study in a few months when we're in Revelation. But this remnant is, is there in Jerusalem, the 144,000 is sharing the gospel, and all of a sudden those people say there's no help, the ones who have not yet believed, but in you. And they look up and they say, Messiah, Savior, Jesus. And in that moment, he comes through the clouds. That's the second coming of Christ, but we'll see that. Uh, Zechariah 14.1 is the day of the Lord, which is uh, very much described in the book of Joel. It's also the tribulation period, 6 to 19 in Revelation, and it's uh, culminated by the second coming of Christ. The next lesson I found is verse two of chapter 14. Armageddon 
isn't just at the Valley of Megiddo. It involves all the nations of the earth, it says in verse 2. It says Jesus touches down on the Mount of Olives, so that's ground zero. And that's why going to the Holy Land, I love it. The Mount of Olives is where Jesus ascended back to heaven. The Mount of Olives is where he descends and rescues his chosen people and begins to reign on earth. The Mount of Olives is where he prayed for us. His, his prayer in, in what we call Gethsemane was right there on the side of the Mount of Olives. That's where his disciples came and were looking up and saw him ascend into heaven. I mean, it's ground zero for so much of redemptive history. Zechariah 14, 5 to 7 says the saints and raptured come with him, as Jude says, that Enoch prophesied in the first eschatology of the scripture. What do I mean by that? Well, let me read to you what it says in the book of Jude, if you want to turn there. That's the little book that's just before Revelation. Here we go, Jude, and it says this, uh, and lo, just a second, I have to find it. Uh, verse 14. Jude only has one chapter, so Jude 1, verse 14. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all and convict all of their ungodly uh, behavior and their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Did you catch that? The second coming of Christ is the Lord coming with myriads, look at this, of saints. That's all the raptured church and all the saints of all the ages are coming with Christ at his return. Wow. Verses 8 on is the millennial changes. And we're going to see as we study uh, through these verses today that the earth starts changing. When Jesus touches down on the Mount of Olives, everything starts changing. Uh, there starts to be healing and a transformation. All of the pollution is going to go away. All of the curse is going to be abated and, and pulled back. Not, not fully removed, but pulled back and no longer affecting earth. That means poisonous animals, poisonous, uh, venomous uh, spiders and snakes, uh, carnivorous, you know, the, the attacking beasts aren't going to be that way anymore. And thorns and thistles and all of that, the earth is going to become like the Garden of Eden again. Fruitful, lush, paradise. No more climate change, climate fixing. And Jesus rolls back the effects of humanity's mismanagement of the earth and of the curse. And the millennial changes take place. Look at this. The total annihilation of God's enemies. Did you catch that there are no unbelievers that enter the millennium? Believing humans populate the earth after Christ's return and live for a thousand years with no sickness, with no predators, with no wars. There are no jails. There are no murderers. It says that Christ is ruling, and if anybody is doing anything out of place, they die. <laughs> That's the way to rule. Just keep everything just and, and safe and that's his rule in justice, in holiness, in love. And he gives everybody just perfect health and perfect weather and environment and everything. And look at this. This is fascinating. We're going to see this in a minute. They go back to the Old Testament feast three times a year. Everybody comes. And I'll show you something funny about that. So I got done reading all this, and this morning, this is what I wrote. And, and that's what you'll learn about when you go to our Facebook page and get this copy. The goal of this course is not only to give you an overview and, and actually a, a mastery of the main points, the outline of the Bible, the key doctrines, the key attributes, the key theological truths that you need to know, and knowing what the, the, those key chapters are, that's knowledge. But Paul warned us, knowledge puffs us, makes us proud. What humbles us? To use the Bible as a mirror. I'll never forget once when I was uh, pastoring in New England at the beginning of our ministry. It was those hectic days. Bonnie and I were just starting out in ministry. We had um, 
two little tiny children that, that we were taking care of. And we lived in this, this parsonage, this 160-year-old house that, that all the pastors had lived in. And one of the things about it, it didn't have any hallways. It was built for fireplaces. So it was just a big square with four rooms and you had to walk through each room to get to the other room on two floors. So there were eight rooms in the whole house. And so when I would get up in the morning, I had to walk through a room to, to you know, kind of disrupt everything. I'd have to walk through uh, the room to get to another room to get downstairs and to get to my study. I walked through the nursery. Everything was connected. So I would tiptoe around, not turn on any lights, and go out to my early morning Bible studies. And so I did that. I went to my 5.30 a.m. Bible study, and it was wonderful. And then I went from there to my uh, next meeting, and I picked up a donut and a cup of coffee, and even was on the news that day because they were filming at that coffee house. And finally, after meeting with people, being on television, I got to my office and my 82-year-old secretary said, uh, Pastor, may I ask you a question? I said, yes. She said, do you mean to have your sweater on backward? And I looked down. I had a, you know, a cable knit, you know, kind of big collared sweater with three buttons. And in the dark, I'd put the three buttons on and the collar was here. And the three buttons were in the back. I'd never had the lights on in a mirror. And no one at all my Bible studies even told me. They just thought it was new fashion. And I thought, oh, we need to look in the mirror before we leave the house, even if it wakes someone up. This is the mirror we really need to look into. The Bible, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, this is the mirror. And we hold it up and we look at ourselves. And the way we do that is we look at God's truth and then we say, God, I see what you need to change in my life. That's what our application prayer is about. So on the screen, after reading all this 12 through 14, these three chapters, I said, Lord, now, this is an example. This is actually the prayer I prayed this morning. And this is how I would like you to start patterning your time in the Word, mining for, for lessons and truths that you can see God use in your life, and then asking Him to do this like this. Lord, thanks for inspiring Zechariah to look across the ruins of Jerusalem and proclaim your plan. I know it must have been hard when everything you told him to say looked impossible. But you, our creator, and Lord of heaven and earth, and you were pierced for me, and you made the heavens and the earth and me. And I want to love you and serve you all of my days. Help me to see your fountain of grace and mercy flowing through many lives as I share your gospel all my days. In Jesus' name, amen. In our passage, we're going to see that God opens a fountain, as you see in that prayer of grace and mercy. Did you know each time you share the gospel and someone comes to Christ, that fountain is flowing? Now, in Zechariah, it's flowing for the unbelieving Jews that had denied Christ that, that come to faith. Everybody is saved the same way. In fact, the famous words that Paul uses for salvation, whoever calls in the name of the Lord, come right out of the minor prophets. It's right out of this time period. For the Jews who call in the name of the Lord, they're saved just like we are saved. Next slide. Let's look at, at what you find when you carefully read a passage through every day of the week. Now, after reading this through, all week long, I want to show you what I marked. Number one, I love this. This is one of my favorite things to, to show you from Zechariah. This is how to share the gospel with a Jewish person. As you read chapter 12, notice who's talking. The Lord, the Lord, in verse 1. Then the, the Lord says in verse 2, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. Then in verse 3, in that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone. And in verse 4, I, the Lord, will strike, and I will open my eyes. And verse 6, I will make the governors of Judah. And now look at verse 7, the Lord. So this just continues right here. The Lord. So 
the same person is talking in verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8. Look, they're still talking. And it will be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour out, in verse 10, on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. And now look at this. Then they will look on me. Now, wait a minute. That's the same person talking. The Lord, Lord, I, I, Lord, I, 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 Lord, Lord, I, I, is me. See what I wrote my No, You probably can't. When was Yahweh pierced only as Christ on the cross? See right there? I have used this over and over with Jewish friends. Uh, Bonnie reminded me of one. One dear Jewish fellow uh, came to me once, saw me reading my Bible, and he said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm reading the Tanakh. I'm reading the Old Testament. I'm reading your prophets. And he was so interested, he actually sat down next to me and said, show me what you're reading. And I actually did uh, this exact same pattern you see on the screen. And then I looked at him when I came to verse 10, and I said, and it says, Then they will look on me whom they pierced, and they will mourn as one mourns for his only son and grieve for one who grieves for his firstborn. And I said to them, I said to this man, I said, When was Yahweh the Lord pierced? And this elderly man sweetly looked at me, and he stood up, and he walked away. Because they can't answer that. Because they have been taught that the Messiah has not come. But do you know what I did? I showed him, like Jesus showed the disciples on the road to Emmaus, he showed them himself in all the scriptures. There is Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Oh, he's all over the place. He's all through the sacrifices. He's all through the, the pictures and the types. He's, he's in all those promises of, of the scepter arising and Shiloh coming. But this is saying that he is God the Son, the servant of Isaiah 53, pierced for our sins. Well, let's go through the whole uh, 12 through 14. The first thing I saw is, uh, the one who stretches out the heavens, that's the cosmos I already talked to you about, that's our creator. The one who laid the foundation of the earth, and I already know who did that because John 1, Colossians 1, 1 John 1, Hebrews chapter 11 tells us it was Jesus. He's the creator. And he's the one that breathed the, the spirit of life into man. And he is the Lord, the judge. And verse 2 says, he is going to make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples. And the whole world is going to lay siege against Jerusalem. Now look at verse 3. I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone. See what I wrote up here in the, in the margin of my Bible? God made Jerusalem the center of the world. All the world's focus is there. That's why there are more news correspondents in Jerusalem than anywhere else in the world except for Washington, D.C. and maybe New York City with the United Nations. There are more news correspondents. Why? They don't want to miss anything. Now, I'm sure COVID has culled their numbers, but normally there's always global news being shot in Jerusalem. It's becoming just what the Bible says. Um, over here, this is Israel, I wrote in verse 10, at Christ's second coming. At the second coming of Christ, so let me describe that again. The Antichrist has, has caused all of the, the Jewish people to come to Jerusalem for their last stand, uh, kind of banding together for the inevitable destruction. And within them, they're hearing the gospel. Do you remember the, the angel has been preaching in chapter 14, the 144,000 from chapter 7 through 14, and these people in the world have heard the gospel and the Jews have heard the gospel. The two witnesses are in Jerusalem 
until the midpoint of the, of the tribulation when they die and are, are taken back to heaven, killed by the Antichrist. So the Jewish people have heard the gospel. And now comes the moment of truth. Death is staring them in the face. And the Lord, look at this, pours out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace. You say, how come they get such special treatment? They don't. Did you know in 1962, God poured out on me the spirit of grace and, and supplication? All of a sudden, I began to be convicted of my sins. I began to fear for my soul. I began to know God was a holy God and that I had sinned in his sight. And I remember asking my mom, what, what should I do? And she says, you need to call in the name of the Lord. You need to ask him to save you. How did I come to that point of wanting to be saved? He poured out his spirit of conviction his gracious work in my heart. See, God is the one that, that stirs our heart. And that's why if you want to share the gospel, pray for people that the Lord will convict them, that he'll stir their heart. Share the gospel with them. Share like, like you see here. You can see my Bible there, all this uh, um, chain-linked little uh, gospel for Jewish people that I already showed you. But share the gospel with them. Share the word of God with them. But pray for the spirit of grace and supplication. Next, in uh, chapter 13, the city and peoples are still there. That's why I said, if, if you want to go to the safest place on earth, go to Jerusalem. Because in that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. Wow. God is going to preserve that city and those people till the end. And so, um, just one thing I wanted to show you here. That's two-thirds. Uh, of all the Jews in this climactic moment at the second coming of Christ are going to be cut off. But the Lord says, I'll bring one third through the fire. And if you want to remember uh, Romans 9 through 11 talks about the remnant and Paul explains that, that huge doctrine. Now look at chapter 14 because this introduces us to the big, big uh, doctrine, the most prophesied doctrine of all, the, the second coming of Christ. Do you know what it's called? The day of the Lord. This is chapter 14 of Zechariah. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. I will gather, look at this. It doesn't happen. It's not it just happens. This is orchestrated by God. I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem and the city will be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished, and half the city will go into captivity, and the remnant of the people will not be cut off from the city. See, God has his, his remnant that he's protecting. Now, if you want to, something interesting. In Ezekiel, let me, Ezekiel 8, sometime, you can track down this incredible message from God when the Babylonians were coming to take Jerusalem. Before the Babylonians got there, Ezekiel sees an angel and the angel comes and puts a mark on the forehead of everyone that Ezekiel says mourns over sin and longs for God. What is that? Believers. People, that's the mark of a Christian. We hate sin and we love Christ. We hate sin and we want to be like Christ and we love God's righteousness and holiness and we see our sinfulness. God marks all the, the true believers in Jerusalem and when the Babylonians come, they don't kill those that are marked. That's how the Lord preserved the faithful remnant that carried the scrolls of the scripture into the Babylonian captivity, that read them, that studied them, that were the, the forefathers of Ezra who copied them. Do you remember we studied all that in 119th Psalm? How did Ezra's family survive? God marked him. An angel of the Lord invisibly marked them so they wouldn't be killed. That's what happens here, but you can read that. We don't have time to go through every possible doctrine, but look at the rest of it. Um, right here, this is ground zero. In that day, his feet, this is Revelation 14, or I mean, uh, Zechariah 14, verse 4. In that day, his feet, Christ's feet, will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east side, 
and the Mount of Olives shall split in two. Wow. This is a major change in the geography, the real ground zero. And the Lord will come with all the saints. That's us. Uh, you know what I wrote there? That every believer gets to go to the Holy Land. <laughs> I, I tell people all the time, I said, either you can go to the Holy Land with me now or some other group, or you can come back on horseback. Jesus is bringing all the saints with him. What a, I, I'm coming on that trip. Are you coming on that trip? I wonder if anybody's still watching this video. If you've hung with us this long, you don't even know the Lord yet. I got an email this week from someone that said, I actually bowed my head and prayed while you told us to. Bonnie and I hear from people just about every week that for the first time they realize that they need to ask the Lord to save them. And all of a sudden, this person says, I just, I just was so aware of my sinfulness. I just bowed my head. They actually paused me from talking anymore and they stopped the video and they just said, Lord, I believe, I want Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I want him to cleanse me. I don't want my sin. I want you. That's calling on the name of the Lord. And if you've never called the name of the Lord, you can today. And then you can come with the Lord <laughs> and, uh, and understand his word. Uh, look at the millennial changes. See, I wrote starts the millennial changes. In that day, living waters will flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea. What's, what's the eastern sea. That's the Dead Sea. And half of them toward the western sea. What's that? The Mediterranean. All of a sudden, everything starts changing. When Jesus touches down in the Mount of Olives, the millennial changes start. And I already covered these in, in earlier when we were going through prophecy in, in chapter 24 of the Psalms. But I'll tell you now, uh, the salt seas start having life. The Dead Sea has life. The ground starts blossoming like a rose. There's going to be fruitful, um, plentiful food for everybody. There's going to be no more famines, no more earthquakes, no more hurricanes. All that starts in the millennium. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth that day. And that's what the scriptures say. Uh, but look what happens in verse 12 of chapter 14. Total annihilation of all those armies. It says, this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who are fighting against Jerusalem, all those armies. Remember, he's flying in and touches down. And as he touches down, this is what happens. Their flesh will dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes will dissolve. Their tongues will dissolve. And then starts the promised millennium. And you can read about that this week. Where are we? We're right here with Zechariah. He's a post-exilic. See, this is the captivity, the exile. He is post, that means after that, he's in the land. He is uh, right here after the uh, destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. Uh, do you remember? This is the, the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom I've talked about so many times. Uh, this is the book of 1 Kings, the book of 2 Kings, showing all of these kings that are, that are reigning. The kings of Israel go from bad to worse in their... Uh, moral condition as seen by the Lord, 975 BC to the end in the Assyrian captivity. The uh, southern kingdom uh, exists until the final carrying away into the Babylonian captivity. Uh, just for you to see, because now we're ending the Old Testament, I have to kind of wrap everything up here. Do you see the book of Genesis that we covered? That covers from the fall of man through to just before the Exodus. And then the rest of the Old Testament that we're finishing up ends right here in the exile. There's a 400 year silent period. Then the New Testament starts and we have the greatest event in all history, uh, the death of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Uh, and then of course the New Testament period right here. And then in the future, which we're looking at now, Israel's restored. However, in the time between now, the end of the Old Testament, and next week, when we get into the New Testament, look at this. Here's the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire. Remember, Daniel's beast. But look what happens. This is where the Septuagint, during the Greek Empire, about 200 and some years before the birth of Christ, 
the Bible of the New Testament world, the Old Testament translated into Greek. That's what Septuagint, LXX, means. It's translated in Alexandria, Egypt, by a group of 70 Jewish scholars. And that's the Bible Jesus used in his ministry. Uh, again, we're looking at Zechariah right here. Remember, uh, Esther, the book of Esther, takes place right here. Uh, in chapter 6 of Ezra uh, during the Persian Empire and Malachi is at, in late Persian Empire. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah come into uh, the city of Jerusalem during the Persian Empire um, after the decree of Cyrus and during the decree of Artaxerxes. Uh, do you remember this is the, the time period of, of the latter part of the Old Testament, the Assyrian Empire, uh, then Daniel has his vision of the, the succeeding empires, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, Greek, the Roman, and this is the Antichrist empire. And that's why it's so vital for us to understand in light of the second coming of Christ. This is what Alexander the Great did. He was from Macedonia, and he pushes all the way, look, to India. That's the great Greek empire, and what that did is that opened up what we call the Hellenization, the, the Greekification of the ancient world, so that they all spoke a shared language, Koine Greek. Then the next thing that happened is the Medo-Persian Empire uh, that was destroyed and kind of, subs well, not really destroyed, but, but eaten by the Greek Empire, shows us all these ancient enemies of of Israel that were always coming and, and marching on them, but Alexander comes and takes them and puts them into his empire. Then after the Greek empire comes the Roman empire, and see the Roman empire takes all of Alexander's empire and the Medo-Persian empire and, and the Assyrian empire and makes this Roman world. This is the New Testament world. And the little lines you can see are the Roman roads. So Alexander got them all speaking Greek, and Rome got them all traveling on these roads so that the gospel could go global. And that takes us to the coming day of the Lord, Zechariah 14. The day of the Lord is used 19 times in the Old Testament. It's called the day of the Lord. It describes the historical judgments and future divine judgments. It's called a day of doom, day of vengeance, day of wrath, when God visits the earth, the great day of God Almighty, and it has terrifying judgments. And that's what we see happening in Zechariah 14. The return of Jesus to rescue Israel, or what we call the second coming, is the most prophesied event in the Bible. And Jesus affirmed Daniel who affirmed that, that four-part image that talked about the coming of this man of sin. And then he gathers all the nations against Jerusalem for the second coming. Now, just because people, a picture can uh, take a thousand words and make it very clear, uh, this is the Daniel 69 weeks. This is the interval, we call it, in which Jesus was crucified uh, and then ascends back to heaven. The temple's destroyed in A.D. 70. Jesus is in heaven. He comes to take us home in the rapture. It kicks off what we call the tribulation. What well, chapter 12 through 14 is right here, the second coming of Christ, to end the rule of the Antichrist and to launch the kingdom of God on earth, which is called the millennium. The Lord goes forth and fights against all the nations, and his feet stand on the Mount of Olives. See, the second coming of Christ is a very, very important doctrine. It's huge in the scriptures. Uh, the second coming is the Antichrist marching toward Megiddo, the kings of the north coming toward Megiddo, the kings of the south coming toward Megiddo, and the kings of the east. They converge, and they're up there kind of getting ready to march on Jerusalem to finish off the last of the Jews when Jesus returns as Revelation 19 and Zechariah 12. It says this, the Lord will strike all the people who are fighting against Jerusalem, all those people coming from all four points of the compass. They dissolve, dissolve, dissolve. 
and the Mount of Olives splits and the earth began to be transformed to the living waters and the, the paradise it's going to be. Now remember this right here is the event that we just spent all this time talking about. Now what happens after that, remember Matthew 25 I mentioned, down in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the sheep and goat judgment, then that millennium starts, God's temple, visitor center, the final rebellion, see all these events. Uh, there are so many of them, I'm just gonna show you these quickly. Israel's persecuted, Jerusalem's ravaged, they flee, the remnant survives, Jesus delivers, starts his reign on earth. See, look, these are all Zechariah. Look at all these verses. And the topography begins to change. See, there, there are entire courses that are only about what Zechariah prophesies. When you go to seminary, it's look at this. A, a, abundant crops, the feasts of, of the Old Testament are reinstituted. All the nations come to Jerusalem. Israel is at peace in the land like God promised. Jesus Christ rules over all the nations and judges them. There is universal peace, it says in Zechariah 9.10. And Jerusalem is the capital of the world. See what I said? The second coming of Christ is the most prophesied event. All of these things are tied to the second coming. Most amazing thing. Well, that's World War III. That's Armageddon. That's when the whole world goes to war against God. So how do you apply that? Well, let me give you a couple ideas. The Creator returns. He is the one who was pierced. He's our Redeemer, but He's the judge. Since we're in submission to Him, what does He want? He wants us to acknowledge we were designed by Him. Did you know there's something you can do that no one else can do? God designed you to do something. Did you know God designed me for this? Did you know I have, since I was a little boy, loved studying the Bible and anything that helps me understand the Bible more. And I've collected books. I have thousands of books, over 7,000. I have, my poor wife has, when we got married, do you know what we had in our car as we moved to our very first apartment? One half of our car were my files of all my studies of the Bible, and she put up with all that because that's what I was called to do. What has God called and gifted and designed you to do? I know one thing all of us have been called to do, to share the gospel. All of us have been called to be in fellowship with other believers. Did you know that the one who bought us wants us to glorify God by obeying Him. As you study Zechariah this week, keep asking the Lord, when I come and answer to you for what I did with my one precious life you gave me, I want to say, I came to do your will and I live my life and I want to hear Christ, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what I'm living for. It's the simplest way to live. Well, as you think about it, this is my wonderful wife, Bonnie, who brings this class to you by recording it. Pray for us. As we do what I'm doing right now with you in classes all day long with students from 30 different countries who are now meeting in our virtual classrooms provided by different missions so we can teach them to do what I am teaching you to do, and that is to go into all the world and make disciples of Christ because he is coming back. God bless you. Have an incredible time in Zechariah 12 to 14 this week. And when we come back, Lord willing, next week, we're going to start the New Testament.